Hi, and thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. It's my privilege to advocate for FIRE as a treatment for colorectal liver metastases. My name is Suzanne Warner. I'm a briefly unemployed hepatopancreato biliary surgeon uh, currently in the process of transitioning to the Mayo Clinic here in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today. I do disclose that my spouse is a urologist who receives consulting fees and speaking honoraria from Coloplast, Olympus, and Boston Scientific for unrelated topics. So the first question is, is this really a debate? Uh, my worthy opponent is Dr. Hop Tran Kao, who seems super nice. He likes my tweets. He's a renowned surgical oncologist, and his personal reputation as a wonderful human is eclipsed only by his reputation as an excellent surgeon and clinician. I would say that our real opponents, and we should all be united against these common enemies, are radiofrequency ablation, cowboys, and uh, RVUs. RFA versus microwave ablation is old and slow. Cowboys can be old or young, but they seem to equate the word can with the word should. And RVUs have a way of insidiously driving practice patterns, kind of like Toby Keith has a way of insidiously getting into your head. You kind of hate that guy, don't you? Anyway, are there objective data to support resection over ablation? Well, it depends on who you ask and how you frame the question. For this argument, we're gonna address solitary liver mets. And I'm, I think that it's, it's pretty reasonable to, to conclude that ablation plus biopsy is at least equivalent to resection. It ha per, uh, ablation has the added advantages of being percutaneously performed and being able to do laparoscopic or robotic procedures if you can't get there percutaneously. The asterisk is to note that if you don't have good IR capabilities, that you can, should consider referring these patients out to places that have better multidisciplinary management capabilities. Ablation in microwave case usually takes five minutes or less. Uh, we're going to review the data today about uh, ablation superiority. Just kidding, there's not much. Uh, and when it's appropriate to use ablation in comprehensive treatment. Again, not a lot of data. Before I move into the solitary liver modality, I just want to highlight this trial, which I think it's kind of undersighted. This is the EORTC 40004 clock trial, which has 9.7 years of follow-up on 119 randomized patients. Um, these patients, this trial was actually comparing systemic versus systemic plus local therapies. And this is not advocating for debulking, uh, but what they did do was say you could do RFA alone or RFA plus resection if you could clear disease, and this was for heavily pretreated patients with less than or equal to 10 metastases. And the reason why this is important is that the, the trial designers used uh, ablation as interchangeable with resection, which I think is where we're moving when we have high quality and reliable ablation. These survival curves are quite impressive. And what the one on the far right shows you is that local treatment did not come with an, an increased uh, risk of extrahepatic disease progression. That being said, radiofrequency ablation is not a great modality if you have others available like microwave. So it depends on electrical tissue agitation and local heating to induce coagulative necrosis. The pro is that radiofrequency ablation is ubiquitously available, has a long track record, and can re achieve reliable spherical ablation zones under three centimeters. But as temperature decreases, you get local dehydration and electric insulation. Um, this comes from, this then comes with it some heat sink, and it makes it harder to destroy the tumors the more you destroy surrounding um, um, cells and tissue. And for this reason, in, in some pathologic studies, up to 28 to 55% of tumors have residual live cells, unless you wait a long time and therefore make radiofrequency ablation take forever, which most people don't have the patience to do. Now, microwave ablation depends on electromagnetic waves, rotation of water molecules, and tissue agitation and heating. It has minimal heat sink and can get real hot real fast. It does not rely on local tissue conduction, so it can achieve larger ablation zones in some cases. And most series show complete ablation in 89 to 94% of tissue when done properly, and a local recurrence rate as low as six to 8%. Now, how come microwave ablation got a bad rap early on? Well, some of the earlier probes had rapid drop-off of energy around two centimeters. They had the heat sink. They had ill-shaped uh, ablation zones and inconsistent ablation zones. The next generation has increased power and predictability, as well as safety improvements like cryolock that help you stay targeted. So if you're sitting there saying RFA is not better than resection, you're probably right. And there's lots of meta-analyses to support this. I think the most well done and most recent is from our, a combination of our colleagues at Leeds and Zurich, which are renowned um, HPV centers, who wound up looking at 1,700 studies and parsing out three of 18 that were eligible 
uh, which really closely looked at resection versus RFA for solitary colorectal liver meds. They did show resection was superior, but they were using old data, which means they were using old probes. Um, and the youngest study was from 2013. Are there also meta-analyses in microwave ablation? Sure, they do show local recurrence is higher in microwave ablation, but they were also using old probes, mixed retrospective data sets, um, and data from predominantly Eastern centers with different practice patterns. There are some new randomized controlled trials that are up and coming, um, but I should point out that they are by radiologists and for radiologists. Um, and I, I'm gonna detail some of those here. So the acclaimed trial is a single arm prospective multi-center phase two study of microwave ablation with limited small colorectal liver mets. What I like about this is that they're mandating uh, 3D targeting, uh, but what I don't like about this is their statement that the purpose of the trial is to establish microwave ablation as preferred curative treatment for colorectal mets that can be ablated with sufficient margin. This is, these are the kind of data that are coming out into the literature. So it's not exactly the type of way to frame a question to get an objective answer. Now, the coverall trial is also phase two single arm. I'm excited about this because they're actually using an imaging modality to see if ablation, unablated tissue can be spotted the next day rather than waiting for your six weeks post-treatment image. The collision trial, which I alluded to earlier, is being brought to us by our Dutch colleagues. It is a phase three, uh, very well-designed trial that is looking at thermal ablation versus resection for quote unquote, well-selected colorectal liver mets less than or equal to three centimeters in size. Uh, I take two issues with this trial design up front. First is the statement that they're evaluating um, uh, in, in some of the editorials, they've said that they wish to prove um, thermal ablation as a superior modality. Uh, but more importantly, um, they are allowing the centers to choose their type of thermal ablation, meaning some centers are going to use RFA and some are going to use microwave. So I think we're still not going to get our pure answer. Now, what do I really think about ablation? I think microwave ablation is fast easier to use and requires a band-aid and the patient gets to go home. The cons are that they do have some fairly expensive probes. You can get a non-spherical burn depending on the probes. And if, you have, if you're bad at targeting, uh, you're gonna get a local recurrence. What do I think about resection? Well, the pro is that you can get it all. You get reliable genomic sequencing and operating is fun. Um, that being said, surgery is, can be highly morbid and, and definitely more costly than an expensive probe. And you might screw up the long game. For a lot of these patients, we're gonna be back in these abdomens for one reason or another. Uh, now that people are living longer and longer with colorectal mets, we don't wanna go in and make it harder for ourselves on the reoperative uh, field. And most importantly, who wouldn't wanna go home after their cancer treatment for their stage four disease? So what to do? When should we be talking about ablation? I think the data is fairly clear that when a tumor is less than or equal to three centimeters and not begging to be resected, like sitting on the periphery asking to come out with minimally invasive techniques, um, the tumor, if the tumor is ablatable, we should be talking about ablation and certainly should be bringing it up with the patient as a possible option. Um, and if the patient has resectable disease, but is not a surgical candidate. When do things get tricky? Well, in young patients, it's really hard to watch scans long-term and to see them every three months for the first two years. Uh, and continue talking about the scans in the ablation zone. More importantly, in heavily pretreated livers, it can actually be very difficult to see on CT scan. And then a lot of patients have to travel for high quality imaging, whether it be CT or MR. Um, the customer service friendly option is resection. Patients want their tumors removed in many instances. Um, when you have a, a lesion that's high on the dome or near a, a pedicle, there's concern for biliary compromise. Uh, sometimes these get a little tricky. I would argue um, that many experienced IR physicians would are able to circumnavigate these uh, obstacles. Um, in terms of treatment sequencing, when to incorporate ablation, I'll defer this to some of the other speakers in the session. What's the real difference between resection and ablation absent any concrete or, or uh, data detail-driven data? I think the real difference is actually RVUs. Um, in terms of ablation, you know, percutaneous and image guided, um, you get 14.9 RVUs for percutaneous ablation plus your image guided RVUs there. But if you're going surgical, you, you, you're going laparoscopic, you get 20 RVUs, open 24. And obviously resection is far more lucrative and resection plus ablation is even more lucrative than that. I'm not saying that many of our colleagues are resecting these patients because it's financially more beneficial. I'm just saying that these, um, these numbers have a way of working their way into both institutional and personal algorithms for treatment of these complex patients in the absence of data-driven guidelines. 
In conclusion, what does the future hold? Well, interventional oncology and radi radiologists are not going away. They're going to continue pushing the envelopes with trials that are not necessarily designed with Dutch rigor. Um, and we can all agree that resection and ablation are good for parenchymal sparing and patients for whom we're playing a long game. Um, I wonder if in the future, if we're able to finally answer these questions crisply, will resection for solitary mets become something for developing nations only because if we can ablate, then we do. Um, but until we truly start separating microwave ablation from radiofrequency ablation in our data and also objectively assessing ablation quality, preferably in real time, we may never know the answer to this question. Therefore, there cannot be a winner of today's debate. Uh, thank you so much for the privilege of the floor and for your time. Sorry, I can't be there with you in person. Thanks again.